Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. All right, good afternoon, Team Crew Lab community. My name is Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Brew Crew Lab Center for Innovation and Creativity. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Crew Lab Center, welcome back to the Broodcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of Cytocor Incorporated, the Crew Lab Center, Marine Corps University, the Naval War College, United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. All right, with that, I'm pleased to introduce our guest for today. First, we have Dr. James R. Holmes, PhD. Uh, he's a professor of strategy, the inaugural holder of the J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy, and a two-time visiting professor of national security affairs at the Naval War College. He has published over 25 book chapters and 350 scholarly essays, along with hundreds of opinion columns, think tank analyses, and other works. Dr. Holmes has been quoted or cited in outlets ranging from The Economist, to Xinhua and appeared on such broadcast outlets as the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, NPR, and the BBC. His most recent books are A Brief Guide to Maritime Strategy and a second edition of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy. Red Star Over the Pacific was named to the Navy Professional Reading List as Advanced Reading and was also selected for the United States Marine Corps and U.S. Indo-Pacific Command Professional Reading List. Dr. Holmes is also a former U.S. Navy surface warfare officer and combat veteran of the first Gulf War, where he served as a weapons and engineering officer on the battleship Wisconsin. In this billet, he held the distinction of being the last gunnery officer in history to fire battleships, big guns, and anger. We also are pleased to welcome Mr. Hunter Styers. Mr. Styers is a fellow with the John B. Hattendorf Center for Maritime Historical Research at the U.S. Naval War College and is a strategy and policy professional at CYDACOR, supporting the OPNAV N522 Navy Warfare Group. His area of inquiry centers on strategy and logistics in the Western Pacific and maritime irregular warfare. Mr. Styers has been recognized twice in the U.S. Naval Institute's General Prize Essay Contest. His first prize winning entry is published as The South China Sea Needs a Coin Toss in the May 2019 issue of Proceedings, alongside a companion piece, Why We Defend Free Seas, and his second prize entry, Win Without Fighting, is published in the June 2020 issue. His related article, They Were Playing Chicken, the U.S. Asiatic Fleet's Gray Zone Deterrence Campaign Against Japan, 1937 to 1940, is featured in the summer 2019 issue of the Naval War College Review. His most recent proceedings piece, Littoral Combat Ships for Maritime Coin, co-authored with Captain Dan Straub, Ph.D., is published in the January 2021 issue. Mr. Styers is a graduate of Columbia University. And finally, our moderator today is Dr. Leslie Wilhelm from the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research, Development, Tests, and Evaluation, who chaired our previous panel on the South China Sea on the broadcast on February 4th. So we're very pleased to welcome everybody today. Welcome back to Dr. Wilhelm. And with that, Dr. Wilhelm, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Ian, and thank you all for joining us on the next installment of our series on regaining the strategic initiative in the South China Sea. This series is about framing the problem differently so as to pose better solutions. As this series has become a tribute to the late Colonel Corbett, we found it only fitting that we should include a panel discussion with Dr. Holmes and Mr. Styers after some great discussions with them on affecting deterrence. In that vein, I am so excited to welcome both of them to speak to you this afternoon. Their unique views on interpreting PRC malign behavior as insurgent actions comes with it a variety of methods to affect deterrence that extend beyond freedom of navigation activities. It is an excellent follow-on to our panel discussion on geopolitics as it further hones in possible actionable paths to affecting our ultimate strategic goals. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Holmes to start our exciting discussion. Thank you, gentlemen. Hey, thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Ian. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with Marines. I was almost literally raised by Marines. Uh, I went through the Naval ROTC program in the late 80s, and we, we actually had something I don't know if it's even done anymore, a Marine colonel in, a Marine colonel in charge, and the de facto exo was a Marine captain. So oh, always a pleasure to spend time, time with Marines. Okay, on to, on to business. 
how the world has changed over the last decade. I used to get pushback when I would say China was trying to redefine contiguous zones and especially exclusive economic zones as territorial seas, seas to which it feels entitled and where it wants to make the rules. Then China kindly went out and informed the United Nations that it claims indisputable sovereignty over the vast majority of the South China Sea, meaning it intends to usurp waters and skies apportioned to its neighbors by treaty and infringe on freedom of the sea at the expense of the entire seafaring world. It also used to be a laugh line when I said non-military shipping, the fishing fleet in particular, is the vanguard of Chinese sea power. Not so much anymore. It has become plain that Beijing likes to reach for the small stick manifest, manifest in the maritime militia. That's an irregular force that is embedded in the fishing fleet and has been for many decades. The China Coast Guard and fellow maritime enforcement services are also part of the small stick, backing up the militia or in some cases taking the lead against rival claimants. These non-naval forces help China get its way while keeping the big stick over the horizon to cow opponents and provide backup in case Chinese forces needed to outmuscle competitors. The PLA Navy and shore-based implements of maritime might make up the big stick. These are the counterparts to Teddy Roosevelt's big stick, the Great White Fleet or U.S. Navy battle fleet a century ago. But again, the Navy remains mostly out of sight to, import, to avoid the impression that China is using military power to bully others. It claims the right to make laws governing what goes on in waters it claims, and therefore it uses law enforcement, not military power, as its instrument of choice. And it wants to accomplish big things with these innocuous seeming forces. Beijing's ultimate goal is to enforce sovereignty, the state equivalent of ownership, backed by a monopoly of force and connoting the right to rule by domestic law over waterways such as the South China Sea. Freedom of the sea will be no more in these expanses if China gets its way. This is a challenge of the utmost gravity and the one that brings us together today. Okay, let's back up and start with first things. What is the strategic initiative and how does a contender exercise it? Uh, Hunter and I could just well, as well call this talk a fighter pilot's guide to South China Sea competition. That's because we look to go-to go theorists such as Sun Tzu, but especially John Boyd, for inspiration about how to regain the initiative. Sun Tzu instructed ancient Chinese warriors to create situations to which their enemies had to conform. Colonel Boyd, a self-made U.S. Air Force strategist who read and embraced Sun Tzu, among other classic theorists, likewise urged tacticians and strategists to take control of the surroundings and compel opponents to try to adapt to them. Except Boyd one-up Sun Tzu. His concept appears far more dynamic to me. Boyd wanted those he counseled not just to take command of the situation, but to change it rapidly and repeatedly. This is what he called fast transients. Changing the setting around a foe in an eye blink disorients the foe and leaves it at a disadvantage relative to the combat baton that imposes the transient. To seize the strategic initiative in Southeast Asia, we need to harness Boyd's logic of fast transients. Now, how did we lose the strategic initiative in the first place? Well, sort of two reasons, partly because of clever strategy on the part of the red team, China, partly because of the nature of the international system. I think it's fair to say China, not Southeast Asians or their allies or partners, has controlled the circumstances in the South China Sea up to now. How many times has Beijing changed the situation around us over the last 50 years or so, springing fast transients on us? The Chinese Communist Party leadership has gotten adept at doing something that appears wacky and at times when outsiders are distracted with other things and unlikely to intervene to thwart its aims. Just a few examples. In 1974, China's maritime militia and navy seized some of the Paracel Islands from South Vietnam's navy at a time when U.S. forces had withdrawn from Vietnam and Saigon was teetering on the brink of collapse. China's gambit met little resistance. In the mid-1990s, the United States was concentrating on the Balkans, so China seized mischief reef from the Philippines and built structures on it. It again met token resistance. In 2009, while we were embroiled in Iraq and Afghanistan even more deeply than today, China notified the UN that it held indisputable sovereignty over most of the South China Sea. That set us to arguing among ourselves about what that meant and not doing much about it. In 2013, it started manufacturing islands out of reefs and atolls, then building bases on its man-made islands. Again, protests but little resistance. And in 2016, it flouted a ruling from the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague that smacked down its claims to indisputable sovereignty. 
being brassy has become China's mode of operations over the past decades. Who does that? This was the tenor of the responses to these moves, both in the region and here on this, this side of the Pacific. And that was the point. Americans and other parties were taken aback, and that was by design. Chinese policymakers and strategists have displayed an acute understanding of the psychology, or the psychology rather, of the custodian of an existing political system, whether the system is a domestic order within a single state or the international order that spans the globe. We want to preserve the status quo that is, and that warrants a defensive and somewhat passive strategy. Meanwhile, Beijing entertains revolutionary ambitions. It wants to replace what is and thus has gone on offense. Or perhaps its ambitions are counter-revolutionary, since it wants to repeal its century of humiliation and reinstate what Chinese regard as the natural sinocentric order of things that was overturned during the 19th century. Either way, its ambitions make for a psychological mismatch that bestows advantages on the challenger, China. John Boyd might not approve of Beijing's purposes, but he would instantly recognize and might applaud its methods. Henry Kissinger hints at this. He informs us that the guardians of an established order have a blind spot toward revolutionaries. We might call this the, oh, you're serious, effect. It is really hard to believe it when someone makes outlandish demands on you, especially when you preside over a generally benign system. You tend to pause and dither, and in so doing, grant the revolutionaries maneuver space, or, in the terms we are using today, the strategic initiative. Counterinsurgent theorist and practitioner David Galula also hints at this blind spot, noting that the incumbent government of a state is prone to waffle during what Galula calls the Cold Revolutionary War. That's the phase before the outbreak of an insurgency when it's not clear there will be an insurgency. The government might just be facing legitimate political movement aimed at reform. It hesitates before a crackdown. Think about the burden that uh, pre-revolutionary ambiguity imposes on political and military leaders, especially when the resistant movement deliberately obscures its goals, as China has. Few governments relish cracking down on citizens, so they are prone to exercise self-restraint until and unless their rule comes under violent challenge. Constitutions limit what they must, must do. So do a set of domestic laws and international covenants of all types. Ethics and morality can come into play, and on and on. The keeper of the regime tends to wring its hands until the challenge becomes violent and thus undeniable. It seeds the advantage. Transpose Galula's analysis into the international realm and then apply it to the South China Sea, as we will today. The United States and its allies have presided over freedom of the sea since the downfall of Imperial Japan in 1945, and yet many factors work against a swift and muscular reply to China's maritime challenge to that system. International law, including such documents as the United Nations Charter and especially the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, provides mechanisms for adjudicating disputes such as China's claims to maritime sovereignty. But legal cases take time. Like incumbent governments in the domestic setting, overseers of the maritime order remain passive while the courts proceed. In the meantime, China continues encroaching on its neighbors and the seafaring world's nautical rights and freedoms. The United States and Asian nations crave good relations with a major regional and economic and military power on the rise, such as China, and they fear doing anything that would make that rising power into an enemy. Old paradigms for, for thinking about China's rise persist in individual minds are, and are encoded in U.S. government institutions. There are any number of impediments to strategic entrepreneurship in Southeast Asia. It takes time and often dramatic events, usually bad ones, to break an outdated paradigm and replace it with something more fitting for the times. Together, Kissinger and Galuba offer a convincing explanation for U.S. and allied passivity dating back many years. By trying not to overreact, as Boyd might put it, we have, we have fallen prey to repeated fast transients. Or, to use Boyd's famous OODA loop, we have been guilty of being slow to orient to the China challenge even after observing what is going on, and therefore we have been slow to decide and act on what we have observed. We have been laggards. We need to orient ourselves to the challenge, decide on a course of the action, and act, asserting ourselves before it is too late to turn back China's gains and prevent it from making new inroads. It's important we get this right. The stakes are, could not be higher, despite what those who assure us these quarrels are mostly about a pile of rocks, goals of trifling importance, tell us. 
As I see it, our problems boil down to immediate operational problems, long-term strategic problems, and a political problem that can hardly be exaggerated. The immediate operational problem is that local claimants such as the Philippines and Vietnam cannot help themselves in sovereignty disputes because they cannot escalate a dispute with any hope of a success. Their coast guards and their navies are hopelessly outclassed. China has escalation control. Alliance politics is another problem. Regional leaders also appear less than confident that the United States will have their back in these disputes, providing maritime resources that might permit partners to compete with some hope of success. Or sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes Southeast Asians fears the United States will oppose China's campaign too forcefully and embroil them in a great power conflict they ardently prefer to avoid. They know they have to live with China forever, but that America has come and might go from the region. In short, allies and partners are unsure of American power and resolve. Uncertainty produces some perverse and counterproductive attitudes towards working together at sea even to serve common purposes of the utmost moment. The long-term strategic problem is that we might see U.S. geostrategy of long-standing undone. Beijing clearly wants to dictate the terms of access to the marginal seas adjoining East Asian sea coasts, namely the China Seas. If others yield to its vision of indisputable sovereignty, the rules of access will be made in Beijing and will not be favorable to U.S. military access. We will see our freedom to conduct overflights, underwater surveys, and other lawful military activities curtailed, and thus will not know potential battlegrounds where we might have to fight. In turn, we will find it hard to pursue the Rimland strategy we have pursued at least since 1945 and arguably before. Access denial threatens our entire strategic position in East Asia and could encourage similar challenges elsewhere in the world. Over time, we might see our forward strategy in the Rimlands undone full stop. Which brings me to the ultimate political problem. If China can declare and enforce sovereignty over marginal waters because it is strong, what's to keep other coastal states from asserting sovereignty over waters they covet? Nothing, in principle. The principle of freedom of the sea, in other words, is at stake, and with it, nothing less than the liberal international order that has served us, our allies and partners, and indeed our adversaries, well, since 1945. So, what do we have to do to take control of the situation and prevent these sinister things from happening? Well, Hunter is planning on drilling down toward the operational and tactical levels, but a couple of observations to set him up. First, Clausewitz, or rather Clausewitz's translators, help us classify the nature of the South China Sea Challenge in operational terms, in actionable terms. In the 1976 edition of On War, translators Michael Howard and Peter Perret chose to translate the German term Gewalt meaning violence as force. But these things are not synonyms, precisely speaking. It is possible to use force without using much or any violence, and that seems to be China's key insight in the South China Sea. In physics, after all, force means applying energy to an object to move it. Hunter will contend that China is mounting a kind of insurgency in the South China Sea. If so, we are talking about a nonviolent insurgency, but not an insurgency whose leaders mind using force. In fact, they use force all the time. Chinese maritime forces substitute physical bulk for firepower, laying siege to to assets Beijing covets, or perhaps uh, protecting assets that it wants to to protect, and they try to overawe competitors without an actual trial of arms. Beijing wins if it disheartens competitors or convinces, convinces them they cannot uphold their rights at a price they can afford or are willing to pay. Second, if this is a maritime insurgency, it is taking place entirely at the lower end of phase one of Mao Zedong's famous script for insurgent warfare. If so, what is Beijing's theory of victory? Can China win without undertaking phases two and and, and three, which are designed to deliver a conventional military victory? And if so, how? Or to turn things around, how do we, the counterinsurgents, win? Should our goal be to balk the insurgent strategy repeatedly over a long period of time until our allies and partners take solace in our leadership and the leadership in Beijing gives up hope? Or should we try to compel the insurgents to escalate to violence and expose themselves as the malignant actors they are? Either way, chances are we are looking at a genuinely long-term strategic competition to determine who can outlast whom. This is a test of stamina in material and human terms. China will try to outlast regional opponents and their extra-regional extra regional rather, but benefactors such as the United States, 
Japan, Australia, or India, and we will try to flip the script and outlast China. As we make the attempt, we should hunt for ways to sow fear and doubt in Chinese minds. After all, fear and doubt are what deterrence and coercion are all about. That's the value of taking control of the situation rather than continuing to let China set the terms of engagement. We need to look for ways to offset, China, to offset China's local tactical advantage and give ourselves and our allies the ability to match Chinese escalation. And as we, do, as we ponder deterrent measures, we should look for cultural chords we can strike that will have outsized impact on Chinese Communist Party leaders. Multinational pushback seems to resonate with party leaders, as do threats to dash part of parts of China's dream of national rejuvenation. The leadership has invested enormous political capital in, in, the, Chinese, uh, in the Chinese Navy surface fleet. Threatening that might have to have outsized impact as well. All of these are avenues that we should and must, must explore as we try to take charge of the situation in Southeast Asia. And with that, I will yield the floor to Hunter. Thank you. Dr. Holmes, thank you for the, those incredibly insightful remarks. I think you, you, you hit the nail right on the head with uh, the use of the, uh, the OODA loop that we are, we need to, essentially we have observed what's happening, we have not oriented, and now we need to, to orient ourselves, decide and act. And that is really exactly what the strategic concept of maritime insurgency and counterinsurgency is all about. Uh, Dr. Wilhelm, uh, Major Brown, thank you very much for uh, for having us to, to um, discuss this, this, vi this vital strategic challenge. Um, as Dr. Holmes said, nothing less than the freedom of the sea and, and the future of the liberal international order itself are at stake. So uh, by way of a, a quick outline of uh, what I'll discuss here, uh, essentially we'll start out with a, a brisk overview of, as Dr. Holmes uh, explained, why, this is, why the Chinese challenge in the South China Sea does indeed constitute a maritime insurgency against the rule of international law and the freedom of the sea. We'll look at how, how it operates and then reiterate why the United States and its allies should care. As we transition to start thinking about what the United States and, and our allies can do about it, we'll look at two historical case studies that I think can guide our actions. And I think it's particularly appropriate we're having this conversation at the Brute Kruleck Center because both of these case studies, Brute, a one Marine by the name of Brute Krulak was a key participant in both in both of these cases. And from there, we'll look into, into what a strategy of maritime counterinsurgency should look like and what those key imperatives that would guide that, such a strategy ends, ways, and means, and then look at the successful prototype implementation of the maritime counterinsurgency concept by Task Force 76 and the 31st MU last year. And from there, I'm, look, I'm very much hoping uh, that we will have time for a robust discussion, and I very much look forward to hearing uh, the thoughts of, uh, of our the attendees on the line. So when we think about um, China's maritime ambitions, um, generally speaking, the, the, what grabs the headlines are the, bi are the big things. We think about uh, China's development of anti-axis and area denial capabilities. We think about the expansion of the People's Liberation Army Navy, you know, particularly in, in the way of capital ships like carriers, cruisers, and destroyers. And when we hear a lot about island building, um, especially, in, uh, especially in, in the D.C. area, we still hear about the, the idea that they are building these islands when really that horse is bolted. The islands are done. The fortification is complete. De deployments have started, and really the focus now is on the things that are, have not hit, really gotten a whole lot of headlines up to date, which is China's coercion of local Southeast Asian civilian mariners. Fully half of the world's fishing fleet operates in the South China Sea. More than 3.7 million people depend on access to the South China Sea for their daily livelihoods. And these civilians are subject to a concerted campaign of intimidation and harassment. Chinese maritime law enforcement interferes with the lawful operations of these local civilian mariners and interferes with attempts by their national maritime law enforcement to protect them. In boarding operations, Chinese maritime law enforcement and maritime militia will steal fishermen's catch. They will confiscate navigational and radio equipment. For at least 10 years that we know about, Chinese forces instituted a regularized system of kidnapping Vietnamese fishermen for ransom. It's very difficult in, when we describe these situations not to, not to come to the conclusion that this is a form of state piracy. And, for, uh, and in the, a Vietnamese scholar, 
a, a, another example, a Vietnamese scholar tells me that Chinese boarding parties will pour gasoline in the drinking water supply of Vietnamese fishermen to force them to return to shore. And in total contravention of the fundamental law of the sea, as if that all of that wasn't enough, Chinese forces not only steal equipment and vessels, they not only you know, interfere and, and attack, really, uh, and interdict the, uh, the, the civilians' operations, um, they will ram and sink vessels as well. As you can see on the next slide, uh, this has happened numerous times. We've seen it with the Philippines in 2019. It's happened numerous times in the case of Vietnam, including as uh, recently as April 2020, um, and many more times that are not reported on because various national governments are trying to keep a lid on nationalist sentiment um, that, and be able to manage a, an already deeply challenging relationship with China. So what is going on here? Well, as Dr. Holmes alluded to, um, well, it's, what's, what re is really happening here is essentially a battle of legal regimes between the two competing systems of authority. On the one hand, you have the freedom of the sea, which is a foundational U.S. national interest. It is a longstanding principle of, of you know, philosophical principle and a principle of international law codified in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And, uh, and on the other side, you have China's vision of what they refer to as blue national soil, which is the notion that you can essentially claim maritime space like land. You can basically fence off a patch of ocean and stick a flag in. So continuing to break this down into what I refer to as the prime factorization of a conflict, I really like to use this particular map from The Economist, which I, it really illustrates in a, a nice visual way uh, what the, the dynamics of the co and the the two different the competing visions of maritime sovereignty. So the blue uh, the blue dotted lines here uh, represent the two the exclusive economic zones of the various coastal states in the South China Sea basin. If the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea were in force, you can see it's parceled out uh, relatively evenly between you have know, the Chinese exclusive economic zone stops 200 miles from their coastline, and then you know, the Vietnamese, the, 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 the Filipino EEZs coming out on either side, and uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei you know, from the south. And in red is highlighted the not, China's outlandish claim to indisputable sovereignty within the entire area of the nine-dash line, which, as you can see, encompasses more than 90% of the South China Sea and essentially disenfranchises all, all of its, its maritime neighbors from their rightful internationally recognized EECs. The nine dash line is advancing an idea that, that you can essentially stick a flag in it uh, in, in a patch of ocean even though it's nowhere near you. Next slide, please. So in, in terms of so this, this dynamic of the battle of legal regimes, if what, what's really going on here, we're having a fight about who governs in a particular space or polity. When we're having a fight about who governs in a particular space and polity, we're really having a, the way that political will is translated into action is through law. So we're having a fight about who governs, in a per, who governs but we're really having a, having, having a disagreement about is whose laws are in force. And if, we, and if we are having a conversation about whose laws are enforced, well, for a law to be enforced, what does that mean? That means that a law is enforced when it is generally accepted and most importantly adhered to in practice by the general majority of the population that it seeks to govern. So at the end of the day, if we're having a, a, a conversation about who, who governs, we're really having a conversation about whose laws are enforced, and that means the, what we're ultimately fighting about is whose laws do the civilians follow. And this is both a metric of success as well as a mechanism of victory. Now, generally speaking, there are two approaches to, uh, to waging a battle of legal regimes. The first one is that uh, it's the conventional method. Essentially, you have your, your two belligerents, you have the civilian population in question, and what essentially takes place is you have a force-on-force -force confrontation between the two belligerents, and then sequentially, the, the one side wins, the other side loses, it's destroyed or pushed back, and then sequentially, the, the winning belligerent imposes their laws on the civilian population in question. The alternative is that of is what we refer to as an insurgency. Now, if, if you have one of these two belligerents that knows they probably aren't going to win that kind of stand-up force-on-force confrontation, um, then you have the alternative of you can actually 
the weaker belligerent has the option of ignoring the other side's conventional forces. And they can simply focus on imposing, say, say, I'm going to ignore the other guy and I'm going to impose my laws on the civilian population directly. So essentially, it is a cumulative strategy. It is, without, it, it is cumulative. It is, it, you start imposing laws and then without first having that decisive battle. And I like to explain this using, uh, using an allegory of imagine you're living in a neighborhood. You're minding your own business. These guys show up. And it really actually doesn't matter who these guys are, whether they are the mafia, they can be a drug cartel, they can be the Taliban, they can be Al Qaeda. It doesn't actually matter. The dynamic is the same. These guys show up. They decide that they really like your your street. They decide it's now going to be their street. It is now their turf. And so they they decide that no one gets to walk down the street. Nobody gets to operate a business. Nobody gets to patronize a business without effectively acknowledging the uh, the authority of the gang, whether that's through paying protection money or otherwise. Now, if now the law nominally says that, of course, it's a free country. You can do what you want. You can walk down the street, patronize a business, all of that, without having to you know, pay these guys off. But if the local police only sends perhaps a police cruiser through, and they are there maybe for ten minutes a day, and then of course they're busy, so they have to move on. Excuse me, they have to move on. Then you as the civilian are left with the question of whose laws do you follow? Whose do you feel confident that police can keep you safe from the reprisals of the gang? So essentially, this is the definition of an insurgency. And you look at China's actions vis-a-vis these 3.7 million civilian civilian mariners who are resident in the South China Sea. And you, you look at China's actions and you can clearly see this is, and you look at the historical analogs, you see this is what the Viet Cong did in Vietnam. It is what the Taliban is doing in Afghanistan today. With the Viet Cong, it was through rice, uh, rice taxes and conscription. The Taliban has, a, we have another really gr- good example, and that's with women attending school in Afghanistan. You, it, we think of women attending school in Afghanistan as kind of a geopolitical charity project. It's not. It is actually a very important metric of who is prevailing in a given district or uh, or otherwise? You can and it is both again this metric of success as well as a mechanism of a victory. If women feel safe going to school, you know, sending their, their girls to go to school in Afghanistan, that is a sign and also a mechanism that they are defying the Taliban's will and the government is prevailing. And conversely, if they do not feel safe sending their their, their girls to school in Afghanistan. That is a sign that the government, which says that you can go to school, is losing. So in terms of key dynamics for the battle of legal regimes, if the decisive question here is whose laws the civilians follow, the implication here is that it, civilian behavior is actually what deci- is decisive. That is what decides who wins. What, proceeding on this line, belligerent actions towards civilians are going to be a whole lot um, more consequential than the actions that the belligerents are taking kind of in this force-on-force way against each other. And so the Chinese understand this. So this is why that they are spending so much time and energy, so much of their national treasure, investing in what Dr. Holmes refers to as, the, as small stick diplomacy, the Coast Guard, the maritime militia, and they are focusing on coercing the civilians who depend on access, uh, on the freedoms under the legal regime that we want to see enforced, the freedom of the state, for their daily livelihoods. And I like, if you will, I really like to use this picture here, where and here is a, you know, kind of a traditional Philippine, Philippine fishing boat, and here's, uh, you can see the, the rigging of the fishing boat in the foreground, and the, you know, the main event in the picture is this big, scary China Coast Guard vessel with its water cannon on. And when this is your day-to-day reality, and I always like to point out, note the empty horizon. No one is coming to save you. When this is your reality day in and day out, whose laws do you follow? And as Dr. Holmes uh, referred to, um, this is very much in keeping with China's strategic canon. I mean, the two major figures in that canon are, as Dr. Holmes mentioned, Sun Tzu and Mao Zedong. Sun Tzu advancing the notion that you must win without fighting. And Mao essentially as the most successful insurgent in history took over a continent using those methods. Um, as Dr. Holmes said, currently in that phase one low-level conflict, 
open question whether or not they, they mean to achieve their objectives at this level or whether they, they intend to escalate to a more conventional military campaign as outlined in phases two and three. Um, I think it's, it's pretty clear if you were to synthesize these two and take them to see, it would really, it is really our choice of whether or not we let them win at this level or whether they, they will choose whether or not to escalate. So why does this matter? Why should we care? As Dr. Holmes, as, as Dr. Holmes referred to, we are essentially, we are an island power. We, we are the leading, the, 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 the leading player in, at the, we are at the head of a maritime order. The freedom of the sea is a foundational U.S. interest because our security is dependent on assuring commercial and military access to the Eurasian rimland. Eurasia and Eurasia and Africa being where the overwhelming majority of the world's population, consequently its markets and all, all the rest, that Eura, Eurasia and Africa, outside North America, that's where most of the world's population lives. If China succeeds in undoing the freedom of the sea, and if they are simultaneously able to advance a continental system of trade through the Belt and Road Initiatives, um, then U.S. And, and our, then the United States and our allied maritime powers, we're going to be left on the outside. And it, the China will succeed where Napoleon failed in creating a Eurasian continental system. Napoleon tried, failed, failed to implement this during the Napoleonic Wars against Britain. Britain was able to trade with the rest of its overseas empire. Uh, but this was essentially what Napoleon was trying to do. Um, so this essentially, if we if we do nothing, um, we are going to be in a situation where China we, we will be living in China's world. This is we have to understand that China is this is China's decisive line of effort. It is actively underway, and if we do nothing. Right now, the Pentagon is spending a whole lot of time and energy. They are thinking about. Of how to fight a war with China in 10 to 15 years. But if we if we do not solve this problem now, we're not going to need to worry about a war in 10 to 15 years because they will have won, we will have lost without so much as a shot being fired, and we will be living in China's world. So looking at how exactly this is implemented, essentially, this you start out with, um, this is uh, to illustrate how, what small stick diplomacy looks like. It is essentially, as Dr. Holmes referred to, it is this cabbage strategy. With, you have the fishing fleet, the maritime militia at the vanguard, supported by concentric rings of the China Coast Guard, followed by the, Mar the People's Liberation Army sitting over the horizon. So essentially, the first, the first line of coercion is from the, the, those, you know, the lowest level of force that's required. They are then support, you know, supported by the stronger forces, and then over the horizon, you have backup if, if if things should escalate, the China, the China Coast Guard, that essentially you, know, you can um, is capable of intervening over the horizon. They have uh, the Chinese have deployed a system of uh, satellite navigation and communication systems aboard all of their fishing vessels, to include the maritime militia, integrating them direct all of these civilian vessels directly into their China Coast Guard chain of command. This allows for much more efficient allocation of China Coast Guard resources um, because. Even though China is, you know, you know, churning out ships like hotcakes, these ships are still expensive, and they don't, they, they are not infinite. So the Chinese have used the civilian vessels that they are looking to protect and use as the front line of coercion as a way of really in increasing the efficiency with which that they can deploy their higher end assets. So if, in the animation here, you have if we have an allied vessel that tries to make an intervention, it is more powerful than, than the militia the Coast Guard's position to intervene. And um, in the event that somebody tries to, you know, a more kinetic escalation to try to overpower the China Coast Guard, because let's face it, the China Coast Guard is actually not very well armed in, in many cases. I and mean, some of their ships have guns, you know, but really, you know, it is totally possible to outgun a China, a China Coast Guard vessel. Well, that's where the PLA Navy comes in. That's where the facilities ashore on, um, you know, the big three of Subi, Mischief, and Fire Cross Reefs come in. And they are positioned to intervene from over the horizon and decisively prevail in any local kinetic confrontation that should develop. Let's look now at the dynamics of freedom of navigation operations, which has been the primary U.S. response to this, this approach. So you take an American large surface combatant and you drive it through. And we, we sail through. We, the, Chi the, the Chinese will send a surface combatant to shadow us through. And we drive through. They wave the, the forces, the local forces, they wave at us as we go by. And then we leave. 
And the Chinese always, they warn us off as, you know, over the radio that you are in our waters. Of course, we're always planning to leave. But I like to um, compare the situation. To, I like to use this shot of uh, from the man who shot Liberty Balance, uh, you know, good old John Wayne Western with, you know, John Wayne, Lee Marvin. It's really not the best the best posture. If John Wayne were to walk up to the, the to the black hat and say, you know what, I um, I really don't like what you're doing in here. I think you ought to leave. The black hat then says, well, you know, I think you ought to leave. Really not the best posture for John Wayne to go, I was just leaving. And I this picture is further helpful because it really illustrates who is the fundamental constituency in this kind of confrontation that you actually are looking to influence. It's not this, you know, you know, white hat versus black hat, good guy versus bad guy. It's the civilians. It's Jimmy Stewart on the floor getting coerced by the bad guy in the, you know in between them. It is the people the people around them who are onlookers. So I think it, it's very it's very useful to think about okay who who are the constituencies that really matter here? And when we sail through, we sail away, and the Chinese can turn around and say, right, well they're gone. We're one, the U.S. is once again over the horizon. Back to business. China is coercing you. We're in charge. And essentially, it is almost worse as if we than if we hadn't done it at all. So, what do we do about this? Let's let's go into get into a couple of these historical case studies. So, the first one is um, that of the uh, first one is of the uh, what is the U.S. Asiatic Fleet and uh, a period where the Asiatic Fleet, supported by their Marine Corps uh, contingent at the Fourth Marine Regiment, uh, undertook a very interesting counter gray zone campaign during a, uh, a pretty unique period of time where Japan was conducting a kinetic invasion of, of China, you know, full-scale invasion between 1937 and 1940. And facing them is this a very small, thoroughly outmoded, outgunned U.S. contingent. So this is the flagship of the Asiatic fleet, the USS Augusta, um, during the Battle of Shanghai on the Huanghu River. Um, while the city burns, I think it's, it's also quite striking that, you know, the, the place that you can see is on fire off the ship's starboard side. That's where all the big skyscrapers are right now. So just it, certainly an interesting evolution. Also particularly interesting, you know, coming back, I, I promised at the beginning that Brute Krulak features prominently in these. Um, Brute Krulak is with the 4th Marines in Shanghai in the city. He is pr protecting American interests, which is really, this is the, the essence of the situation. Essentially, while the Japanese are, you know, conducting this this full-scale kinetic invasion of China, the Asiatic fleet and and uh, these, you know, small forward deployed U.S. forces are left to are are, are left to contend with a Jap simultaneous to this kinetic invasion, a Japanese gray zone effort to try and force U.S. and West and other Western powers and their interests to force them out of China, preferably without fighting. And under the command of a very talented sailor diplomat by the name of uh, Admiral Harry Arnell, one of the Navy's only four four-star um, admirals at that time, uh, the Asiatic fleet is able to successfully deter the, this gray zone aggression, even though they are you know, a couple of hours of steaming time from the main bases of the, the Imperial Japanese Navy in southern Japan. And you know, one of the, the critical elements here that uh, Yarnell um, employs is uh, it's an, he's a really a, a radical, you know, ahead of his time, exponent of mission command. He will send ships to you know, di you know different you know, far flung stations, and he will give their commanders very wide reign. He will send you know, one you know, destroyer captain described getting sent to a um, to a port that was with American interests that were under threat from a Japanese invasion uh, that had just come ashore, and. Yarnell's orders to him were essentially protect American interests. And when he asked for more specificity, he says, protect American interests. What this, what this permits is actually, a, we think of this as actually a you know, kind of a risky thing to do. That, okay, what if, some, what if this junior commander who's on scene, what if he screws up and something goes wrong? It's, at, what, it's really interesting here is that it's actually a, a remarkable risk-limiting strategy at the strategic level while potentially gain maximizing. What this permits is a, uh, a much more assertive local action by that local commander. Yarnell can essentially pocket any gains they make 
And if something goes wrong, they can say, look, this was a junior guide, and we can sort this out. It can prevent something from blowing up into a larger incident than otherwise. There's a really good example of this one American destroyer that gets sent to a situation into a situation where the Japanese are firing over them with their artillery, trying to make them shift anchorages in um, it, from a place where they need to be in order to, to maintain you know, line of sight to two different key U.S. interests. And the captain, we have his oral history, and he describes going ashore to meet with the admiral, uh, the, the Japanese admiral who is um, uh, in command of the forces in the area. And they have this exchange, and he says, well, you know, you're firing over my ship, and um, if you were to hit us, we would have to respond with everything we have. Of course, the little four Piper destroyer, no one's particularly afraid of it. But uh, the admiral says, well, you know, I'm confident we're not going to make a mistake. Of course, while the captain is ashore talking to the admiral, there's a first, the, the first lieutenant is in command, and he is a very assertive young officer. Um, and while the captain is ashore, the Japanese let off a shell very close to the ship. The, cap, the, 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 the first lieutenant immediately orders the ship to general quarters, trains all the main guns on the offending main batter, uh, the, the offending Japanese gun battery, which is, you know, a couple hundred yards away. And, and you know, each of them, the, the captain and the first lieutenant, you know, the captain, after his exchange with the apple, says, oh, the Japanese didn't fire over us again. And the, this even more junior officer says, yes, after we pointed all our guns at them, they didn't fire over us again. This does require um, a th this local graze on deterrence force to be backed up with a militarily credible deterrent over the horizon, which in this case was, was provided by the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And what's, particular, and what's interesting about this case is you see, you know, even in spite of this, you know, the, the gross mismatch in terms of materiel and so forth, um, the Asiatic Fleet is, in fact, highly successful at deterring uh, Japanese actions. There's a point where the Japanese you know, significantly escalate their efforts to, um, to push the U.S. and other Western interests out of China. The Asiatic Fleet counter-escalates to match them. The Mon Yarnell's mantra, you know, today we talk about fly, we will fly, sail, and operate anywhere that international law allows. He says, we will, we will protect American interests and, you know, lives and property wherever they are threatened. And Ultimately, the Japanese are forced to back down their strategy having failed, and they subsequently de-escalate. Ultimately, the Asiatic fleet has to leave in China because the global strategic situation deteriorates you know, beyond their control, as in France falls uh, in 1940. And that makes it clear to the next commander of the Asiatic fleet that a war is coming. He's very prescient in that. Um, but uh, nevertheless, this episode is an interesting and, I think, applicable model to deterring uh, hostile gray zone action, even with a substantially smaller force. And uh, the uh, next case study is that of uh, the Marine Corps Combined Action Program in Vietnam. So where previously, Brute Krulak, you know, in the, he was you know, with the 4th Marines in the Battle of Shanghai, protecting American interests in um, the Shanghai International Settlement. And eventually also, it was during this period of time that he gathered vital intelligence on Japanese landing craft capabilities that led to the development of the, Hig the ramp out Higgins boat. Um, here, he's the commander, Brute Krulak is the commander of Fleet Marine Forces Pacific. He's essentially the force provider for forces in Vietnam. And essentially, he comes up with a, this wonderfully innovative concept that, um, that allows American forces to achieve remarkable economy of force while simultaneously being much more effective at uh, not just deterring, but in this case, it's a traditional counterinsurgency environment, actually defeating the adversary. Um, what this um, what this created was a, a, the, the concept was that um, whereas William Westmoreland and the U.S. Army is essentially focused on these large unit operations where we take a battalion, we sweep through a village, spend a couple hours, then move on. Um, important analog to freedom navigation operations with large surface combatants today, um, which this is. The Westmoreland approach proves highly effective, you know, even though, because, you know, if you're dealing with 12 cadres with guns, if you send in 800 guys, they know they're not going to win. So they're going to leave town, wait for you to move on, and then come back and continue coercing the civilian population. Brute Krulak's approach, along with uh, the local Marine Corps commander, Lou Wald, was uh, to essentially focus on local home defense militias called popular forces in these different Vietnamese hamlets essentially bring in a squad of Marines to work with a platoon of the um, of popular forces 
to create this combined action platoon. They live con you know, continuously in civilian communities that are dealing with an insurgent presence. They are able to, so in, from a, a tactical perspective, each component of this combined unit is raising the effectiveness of the other. So the, the Marines are bringing all the, the you know, cool toys, the operational enablers that the United States always brings to the table. That's artillery, our air support. We bring heliborne quick reaction forces, helicopter medevacs, and access to our logistics chains. Meanwhile, the popular forces, they're bringing local knowledge. They're bringing determination to defend home. And the, the critical element with this approach is a, is, the pers is a persistent presence, which is something that the Asiatic fleet sought to achieve as well. It's, you know, a persistent, we are going to, it's similar to what the Chinese refer to their current operations in South China Sea as endurance warfare. Uh, this is about establishing, as it was used at the time of the Vietnam War, credible permanence in the eyes of the civilian population. What this, in terms of the operational level and what this allows us to achieve, the, the combined action program allowed essentially the, the, counter, the counterinsurgent forces to fight like insurgents. We are you know, living in and amongst the civilian population, seeking to provide them with protection, you know, and go after the, the people who are coercing them, who are you know, essentially imposing rights taxes, who are, who are conscripting their youth, um, all of that. We show up and we stick around. As Dr. Holmes has written a number of times uh, you know, recently, that if 90% of life is showing up, then the other 10% is about sticking around once you got there. Um, and also, additionally, in the counter, in insurgents, counterinsurgency environment, the command action program allows the counterinsurgent to essentially force the insurgency to give battle on terms that are favorable to the United States, or they must accept defeat. Talk about resting the initiative. We are seizing, whereas previously, when we are out looking around, you know, in the hinterland, uh, with those big forces going into different Viet Cong base areas, we are essentially ceding the initiative to the adversary to fight us if they want to. Here, we are v threatening their vital interests, you know, in getting back to this idea of whose laws the civilians follow. We are directly contending the battle of legal regimes where this, in the same way that the insurgents were contending the battle of legal regimes. They must give battle or they must accept defeat. And this allows us to bring all of those combat enablers to bear in a, where, in a way that we were actually fighting from a disadvantage when we were out, you know, seeking battle on large scale with a battalion-sized force. Um, so in terms of results, you get with a remarkable U.S. economy of force, we are, we, in terms of, we, we put in 2,200 Marines, that's in terms of the same number of riflemen as a Marine Corps rifle battalion, we yield a force of 20,000. That's the same number of riflemen as in a division. Using the statistics available at the time, you see measurably higher degrees of civilian population security. You see proportionally fewer U.S. and allied casualties and proportionally more casualties inflicted on the insurgents. Um, so um, so um, starting to think about, okay, what does we want, what does maritime counterinsurgency start to, um, start to look like? So in terms of historical takeaways, if, if we try to synthesize these two cases into something that we can work with. For starters, as long as China continues to think that they're not going to go, they don't want to go to war, you have something that is, starts to look kind of similar to the situation the Asiatic fleet faced, where the Japanese did not want to go to war between 1937 and, 19, and 1939. They were not interested in that, but they still wanted to get their way. What that meant, however, is that they are going to do everything they possibly can to try and force us out. You know, think of you know, the artillery shelling over the USS Bulmer in, in, in uh, Amoy Harbor, now GMN that situation I was describing with the first lieutenant and the captain. But they are going to be constrained in their degree to directly compel us to do what we want, or to, do what, to make us do what they want. Likewise, we are going to be constrained. We think a lot about how we, we're constrained, and if we're not going to war, we're not going to be able to you know, shoot at them first. Well, guess what? If they don't want to go to war, they can't shoot at us either. Um, what the, the implication of this is pretty important. Strategies that rely principally on deterrence by punishment are going to be much weaker than, um, you know, so essentially deterrence by punishment being, okay, if you cross this line, I'm going to screw you up, as opposed to something where I'm going to keep you from crossing the line, or I'm going to make it painful for you to cross the line, you know, a deterrence by denial strategy. If it's all about testing the limits under which you are going to activate your deterrence by punishment, that, that's the entire premise of this strategy. 
So what we need to do, if we have essentially, uh, as it was um, put very well by uh, a colleague and Pacific Fleet, if right now we have a um, a periodic high-end presence, if we are kind of like the SWAT team, using the police analogy, what we need is something that is going to be closer to the beat cop, something where we are going to be on scene where, okay, maybe you can overpower the beat cop, maybe it's a body with just a baton, but now, like that's the trigger that's, you know, if you mess with the body, then you're bringing in the SWAT team. Um, so essentially this combination of deterrence by denial combined with the threat of punishment in case you attack that deterrence by denial force can be much more effective. And then the last, and then the last point, on, economy of force is going to be critical. This is, a, again, that phrase endurance worker. This is about staying in the game and it's going to be critical from a political point of view, not to mention the economic point of view, to be able to you know, try to make this as cost efficient and sustainable as possible. And that means you got to work with local allies and partners. It means, you know, frankly, from an access and basing but, you know, perspective, I mean, they're right there. Um, not to mention it's their, you know, exclusive economic sense we're trying to help help them defend. Combined action is going to be a lot more effective. Um, that, you know, working so working with local partners can be a lot more effective than if we try to do this by ourselves. So in terms of so getting into kind of an end ends ways means kind of conversation. So in terms of objectives. First off, we have to protect these local civilian mariners from Chinese depredations on their rights. Um, you have to, it, this requires what the Combined Action Program sought to implement, which is this notion of credible permanence in the, in specifically credible permanence as a perception in the eyes of the civilians and in the eyes of their governments. And then you, using this, you know, the greatest degree of U.S. economies of force so that we can stay in essentially indefinitely, um, we want to make, we have to work with these local partners. We want to make sure that this is something that we can sustain for years, if not decades. We need to, this is just, this is a vital U.S. national interest. Um, this is something that we do need to protect. If it goes away here, it, as Dr. Holmes said, there's no reason to believe that there will not be others to follow, you know, um, China's approach to this, you know, revisionist sense of maritime sovereignty that you can, you know, stick a flag in. Uh, both in the region and around the world. This is something we we must do or we are going to see our entire strategy undone. Now, in order to accomplish this, we need to make sure that we can continue to do it for a very long time. So that means the, cap the capital ship fleet that we have is already kind of overstretched. They're also not necessarily the right tools for the job because they're you know, really focused on that high-end war fighting rather than low-end low -end deterrence by denial. You want to try to avoid straining those guys as much as you can. And so, um, in a way, the capital ship role is going to be much closer to maintain the militarily credible warfighting posture to deter an attack on whatever smaller force you have doing that deterrence by denial of maritime counterinsurgency. In terms of ways, kind of some guiding principles, for starters, we need to make sure that in getting, continuing on this realm of military, military credibility, how we plan to fight is going, needs to be influenced by how we're postured short of war. What that means is that we we don't get to we, there's thoughts out there that oh we can just kind of withdraw to the second island chain um, and you know shoot long range hypersonic missiles at somebody from Guam. That's not an option because unless you are going to you know, run away in peacetime, um, if you are not ready to fight from that forward position where you are you know seeking to protect um, these civilians and, you know, and our allies and partners from, uh, uh, from gray zone to, you know, aggressive action, um, you're going to lose. You're either, you, and likewise, how we're postured short of war has to be influenced by and ready to support how we plan to fight. So essentially, it, it goes both ways. You have to have a symbiotic relationship between uh, the gray zone deterrence force and the high-end deterrence force. You don't get to pick and choose because if you don't support one, if you don't have a, a, a uh, credible warfighting posture, then they can just escalate and, and beat you that way. If you don't have a credible posture that can defeat them at the low end, then they will never need to escalate and they can get what they want without ever, ever having to fire a shot. So that means that whatever force that you allocate to maritime counterinsurgency it needs to be able to transition from that gray zone deterrence to a, an offensive or counteroffensive inflicting disproportionate damage early on in a fight. So that if we're talking about contact and blunt layer, you need to be able to go from the contact to the blunt mode very rapidly, like 
that. Launch your missiles and go. Um, and there's an opportunity here um, that maritime counterinsurgency presents, presents an opportunity for to get the forces that you think you're going to need um, for a war, get them into position as uh, you know before that high end fight, hopefully you know, to deter it so to, to it never happens. This notion of win before fighting or win without fighting. Um, if it, it is going to be a lot, I think it's going to be a lot easier to convince our allies and partners. And if you're if you try if you go to the Philippines or someone like that and you say, look, we really want to borrow your territory so we can put a lot of missiles there. So if we ever get into a fight with China, um, we can launch missiles against their ships and, and homeland from your territory. That's not going to be something they're going to want to readily sign on to. Much different conversation if to use I mean, the, the late the words of the late great Art Corbett, who was a major influence on this thinking, um, and certainly expeditionary advanced base operations forces we're about to get to, they are critical here. If you present this as we are looking to protect and empower you, help you protect your civilians, empower you to protect your civilians, and defend your national sovereignty over your you know, and, and your rights and over your exclusive economic zone. That's going to be something that's going to be a lot more interesting to a lot of allies and partners who are dealing with this really difficult problem where the Chinese have escalation dominance. If we show up, we combine our forces, and we say, look, we're going to work together on this. Um, that's going to be a much more appealing. So now, means. How do, how do we start to think about maybe, you know, some principles of force design and operationalization? So as, um, you know, as um, Captain Josh Taylor put it, at, uh, we had a great panel a year ago at the West 2020 conference. Um, he said, he, he, he put it very well, which is that you need to add a persistent low-end presence to the current periodic high-end presence. So right now, the destroyers are coming through every so often, you know, periodically. you got to have something that is there all the time. And can stick around, can loiter, can protect these civilian mariners. So at the low end, um, you have essentially this kind of counterinsurgency patrol force. It, it's got to be relatively small, relatively expendable units with agile logistics. Good thing to have here because if, if we're talking about you know taking it right up, using force but um, or using force but not violence. Um, one of the principal ways in the maritime domain that you can use force without using violence is something like a collision. So you're probably going to want something, you know, if you can have a um, a strong hull for, to withstand a collision, whether that's ice rated or otherwise, that's probably going to be a good thing to have. Um, and it's also going to be very helpful to have higher-end anti-ship anti missiles that are ready to support kind of, in, if things go bad, your opening salvo or counterattack in something that goes high intensity. And then at the, at the high end, in terms of a covering force, that you basically need this, this high end combat capability to, as a protection for that low end force, deterring that kinetic attack. And if things go bad, they help cover the retreat and withdrawal of the low end force. Uh, basically, that's where some of these capital ships come in. And you know, a really effective way to do it in a very cost effective way would be expeditionary advanced base operations, you know, arts brainchild. Um, a persistent ground-based anti-ship and anti-aircraft missile force. So, in terms of some of the combatants that were, you know, that would make sense, you've got things like the Japanese Hayabusa class, you know, the, the Korean equivalent, the PKG, uh, littoral combat ships. We're going to get to how they were actually a hero in the prototype implementation um, last year. Uh, the Mark VI patrol boat, definitely on the small side, but uh, especially if we're talking about inside the uh, 200 nautical mile range out from your shoreline. Um, this is something, you know, first off, you can base it anywhere. Um, you can, if you support it with an agile light tender that can shift around to all those wonderful harbors that the Philippines has, um, or Vietnam, likewise, um, you know, with a 600 mile range, all of a sudden you've got a third, a third, a third in terms of range of, you know, 200 miles out to your, your station, 200 miles of range of kind of essentially uh, loitering and you know, being able to re react, and then 200 miles to get home. And then the other thing I'd just point out is, uh, the, this is the Korean, uh, the bottom right is the Korean Navy uh, Daegu-class frigate, which um, the Korean Navy's building philosophy, is, because they got into a couple of gunfights with um, the North Koreans off the northern limit line uh, about 20 years ago. And since then, their posture has been about putting the biggest gun that will fit and the smallest hull that will accept it. So here you see the 2,000-ton frigate with a five-inch gun on the front. It's something we see only with like a 10,000-ton U.S. ship. 
Um, this is probably a good idea because a lot of these kinds of exchanges are going to happen within minimum missile range. Within, you know, you're going to be in direct contact a lot of the time. Best if you can win, you know, win that gunfight first and put them on the bottom first before someone tells you to stop. Um, so, um, the, so in terms of, so, so just to briefly sum up with, in terms of a prototype, the prototype implementation that the, the Task Force 76 and the 31st MU implemented last year, um, great example in the form of the West Capella incident. So last year you have a Malaysian survey ship that's getting harassed persistently by uh, chi by Chinese maritime militia and China Coast Guard forces, and it, there's a rival Chinese survey ship. This is in the Malaysian's recognized exclusive economic zone at the southern end of the Nine-Dash Line. Um, so the first thing that we that we do is, you know, Task Force 76 is essentially on point for this. So, so the first thing is that, you know, Admiral, Admiral Fred Kacher and his team at Task Force 76, they're you know, embarked on USS America, terrific forward deployed platform, you know, fifth generation fighter combat capability, um, accompanied by, you know, a cruiser and a destroyer. They bring this strike group south. It's kind of the, the opening move in what, in, in this situation where we decide to make a move to try to support Malaysia. Um, we bring it to the scene that the PLA matches it with, you know, roughly similarly sized task force of its own. Um, now, the capital ships, of course, they're busy. They've got stuff to do. They can only stay about a week. They've got a Taiwan Strait transit to do. They've got a pair of fun ops to do. Uh, they eventually have to rotate back north. So initially, this led a, couple, a number of observers internationally to say, oh, here we go again. Here's, the, you know, getting back to that fun up slide with the animation. Here's the, you know, large service combatant coming through, doesn't stick around, drives away, and, um, it's, and it's almost worse than if we'd never come because the Malaysians, you know, they heard about it on CNN or something like that. They weren't super happy initially. Um, so learning to be had there about coordinating them uh, with them beforehand. Um, but uh, that was the initial reaction. But then the critical thing, something very important happened, which is that Task Force 76 started cycling in its littoral combat ships that it had to, for deployed to Singapore. So here you have USS Montgomery on the way, as you can see, towards the West Capella in the distance. Um, this is, and what these ships do is they essentially, um, they um, they sustain this persistent presence. And importantly, as you can see from this picture, we put the helicopter up, we take pictures of us on the way, and, you know, with the West Fell in the background, and we publicize that, you know, here's the littoral combat ship, you know, sustaining a presence near the West Capella. Now, we publish this picture as USS Gabriel Giffords, this one armed with the Naval Strike Missile, as you can see on the foredeck. Um, USS Gabriel Giffords sustains persistent presence near the West Capella. As you can see, you know, right, you know, not even, looks like you know, maybe two miles or something, um, or, or less. And for sustaining that presence, and we do a number of these, these revisits to show that we are sticking around, we're not going away, the Chinese reaction is noticeably demure. They're like, oh, the situation in the South China Sea is improving. None of this harsh bellicose rhetoric, the, the harassment subsides, and the West Capella is able to successfully complete its mission as previously scheduled, despite a lot of Chinese pressure. So obviously now people pointed out, well, you we don't really know how far the Chinese were planning to go, what they, where their plans were, if they were planning to leave anyway, as you know, we always do uh, with the freedom of navigation operations. Well, guess what? We're not going to know for 30 years. And this is a reason, it's a reasonably good inference that we won this one. And then there's an even more clear cut victory later on. Um, in, so this was in April to May of 2020 in July. Very interesting incident, again with the Gabriel Giffords, uh, where the Chinese tried to pull a similar playbook with Vietnam. They put this, you can see in the background, this uh, blue Chinese survey ship um, they sent into the uh, Vietnamese exclusive economic zone, seemingly in preparation for an illegal hydrocarbon study inside the Vietnamese EEZ. And the Vietnamese Coast Guard, very robust, they mobilized a response and they're on their way out. And then we sent the USS Gabriel Giffords. And we sent, and we, again, we put up the helicopter, as you can see, and we take a bunch of pictures. This is one of them. Um, and it sh we take pictures showing the Gabriel Giffords circling the Chinese vessel at pretty close range and loitering nearby, just kind of hanging out. And within a, a day or two, the Chinese ship went back to its home port. Again, 
we don't know the decision making process on the Chinese side. We won't know that unless we win the whole thing and you know the records department opens like you know, the Soviet records did. Um, but this sure seems like a pretty solid win. Now, immediately, shortly thereafter, the, uh, the Chinese stand out six more survey ships. So no victory is ever final in this case, especially when you're not sinking anything. But this is a really good idea of what victory looks like. Um, and I go, so Captain Dan Straub and I, who he was uh, division chief for China on the Joint Step J5 at the time of these incidents, he and I have a, a, an article in the January 2021 issue of Proceedings, which looks at this incident and also some of the cool capabilities that the LCS could be, you know, be used to bring to the table. So just in conclusion, um, um, in terms of what basically this notional operational concept would look like, um, you get your light forces in among the, these local civilian mariners, supported over the horizon by forces ashore and you know, higher end forces at sea. And essentially, you just exercise this persistent presence and you, you, de- you know, delegate authority to, these, to local commanders. And essentially, you implement Art Corbett's vision of, uh, of expeditionary advanced base operations on a number, of, you know, on this key maritime terrain. And what you start, if, if you implement all, all of these different elements here, all of a sudden, when we think about, oh, the Chinese have got this very scary basing complex in the South, in the South China Sea. Well, so that's them, more or less, their range rings. You know, again, not very much not to scale. This is, you know, this me PowerPoint animations here. Uh, not any, you know, the cool CSBA graphics that I, you know, and love. Um, you implement this along the first, you fortify the first island chain, and then if you work with allies and partners like Vietnam, all of a sudden that starts looking like a much more interesting posture for the United States and our allies um, in terms of what what we can cover and what we can help protect, at the, or in protecting our, this local, and protecting and empowering, as Art, as Art says, um, the local civilian, uh, our local partners and local civilian mariners of our allies. So uh, with that, I very much look forward to uh, a, what I hope will be a robust discussion. Um, I've got some you know, notional questions that we can talk about, um, you know, as thought starters up here. And then, you know, there's a couple other slides, you know, about if you want to talk about unmanned systems and then uh, some links um, on, on the last slide. But thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. And I'm looking forward to uh, your feedback and benefiting from uh, your perspective. Thank you. Uh, fantastic, Ian. Appreciate it. Mr. Purnell, are you able to um, ask your question about unmanned? Well, it was, it was uh, semi-rhetorical to the community that um, it does not appear that unmanned vessels really contribute anything to the counterinsurgency effort during the competition phase, uh, other than potentially as uh, recording devices. But in terms of actually executing uh, sovereignty or supporting uh, administrative control uh, by our allies, um, they don't really contribute much. Doc, do you want to take that one first, or? Um... Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, I was actually going to let you feel that because we were ta- we were having a side a side discussion about it while you were talking. But I, basically, the gist of what we what we were talking about is. I don't know. It, I mean, I could be convinced otherwise, but I I have doubts about it. I mean, it's a, when you start talking about substitute. I mean, Admiral Wiley t- he tells us that his classic quotation about military strategy. It's about control, and control is exercised by the man, not not by a gun, but by the man holding a scene, holding a gun on the scene, and that, like you said, staying staying there for very long periods of time in order to in order to assert that presence. I don't, it, it just feels it just feels like if we start relying on uh, unmanned systems, it feels like we're trying to take the human out, the human out of a human enterprise uh, called comp, called competition, which I think you could describe it. So I would certainly describe it as a virtual form of warfare designed to shape perceptions among audiences that matter. So I could say I could see some marginal importance for them, but uh, as far as making them the main uh, the main bearer of our of our strategy in the South China Sea. Yeah, it, it, it just goes against the grain. But uh, but again, Hunter may have other ideas. We certainly did not uh, coordinate our ideas on, on these things. I, I very much agree. Um, I think that um, unmanned vehicles in general are, on the one hand, they're very they can be very helpful and they're very cost effective to provide um, uh, certainly you know, enhanced ISR capability. Um, you look at um, there's a lot that they can contribute for sure. I mean, especially when you think about if, whether or not we 
field something similar to the, Jap- the Chinese Baidu satellite navigation systems that they put on their civilian vessels. That kind of ISR capability of eye, literally eyes on the water could be provided in some respect by you know, unmanned systems so that there's a role for them to, be, to play, particularly in improving the posturing and the efficiency of deployment of our manned assets. Um, that said, in terms of unmanned vehicles as presence vehicles, you know, presence unto themselves, not supported by people um, who are actually on the scene, uh, in, you know, at sea or in the air, um, that's going to be a lot less effective. I mean, I think one of the most effective practitioners of this kind of, whether it's gray zone or you call it, whether you call it gray zone warfare or maritime molecular warfare, is Iran. And we saw in 2019, um, and I wrote about this in uh, the article in for the General Prize in 2020, we have seen, we saw multiple sovereign U.S. aircraft fired upon and shot down by Iran in 2019 with no U.S. response. And now we can go back and forth as to whether or not the U.S. response would have been appropriate, as you know, some were discussing and we were up in, on the verge of implementing at the time. But is very we have already signaled that we view unmanned aircraft as different from manned aircraft. And um, as such, and I think you know, something similar would apply to boats. I mean, we saw actually, frankly, the uh, the Chinese already seized an, an unmanned underwater vehicle uh, at the very start of the Trump administration. We didn't do anything there. Eventually, they gave it back. Um, that is, I think those are indicative that that's not a very that's not a good deterrent posture. Now, in terms of, you know, I can see in the chat, chat some conversation about, okay, you know, some of these, you know, smaller assets, you know, this notion of expendability, not great, especially if you're the person on the boat. I mean, you can look at, you know, Kemp Tolley and his example of, you know, he was his first mission as commander of the USS Lanakai, like a 65-foot schooner that was out commissioned at, but shortly before, days before the outbreak of the Pacific War. He was supposed to go out and basically get sunk by the Japanese fleet in order for them to um, continue to maintain their operational security um, as they were moving in on the Philippines. And in getting sunk, that incident would, uh, and basically in in Kemp Tolley, you know, the then lieutenant, dying, that would give Franklin Roosevelt the incident that he needed to bring the United States into the war before the Japanese could actually land their first punch on at Pearl Harbor or elsewhere. Um, that was the idea. Really not great if you're Kemp Tolley. If you're trying to make it to deter, and I don't think Kemp Tolley was in, was real, that was not a deterrence mission. That was really a tripwire mission. Um, if you are trying to deter, if you're, you do need to put people in the path of a prospective Chinese bullet or shell, um, in in this case, though, I think there is a role for potentially an optionally manned system, something that you could, like, if, if you could take the people off of Mark 6, if you think, okay, this is actually about to get really hairy, um, that might be an interesting approach. Um, but uh, but short, short of that, an unmanned system, we have seen, you know, that is an acceptable action Below the threat and that is considered below the threshold of armed conflict to use kinetic force against an unmanned vehicle. So I, I think that it, does that answer or respond to your point? So I, um, I read uh, you know, quite a bit about Chinese uh, emphasis on blood, blood at risk, uh, particularly when we look at conflicts between China uh, and India and uh, Vietnam, that they demonstrated the seriousness of the situation to their competitors by putting blood at risk. And unmanned systems don't do that. Um, So I think it's a key element that, yes, um, manned optional systems uh, give you more flexibility, but if you really are trying to get the other guy to uh, stand, you know, uh, uh, call his bluff, then blood has to be at, at risk, and uh, unmanned systems don't uh, uh, don't convey that. Um, maybe there's a strategic ambiguity about 
does he know whether or not that platform is manned or not? But uh, if you really are saying, I own this street, or I'm going to keep this neighborhood safe for my neighbors, then uh, blood has to be at risk, and the Chinese write about that a lot. Yeah, the better for our skin in the game, we need to be convinced, not only our competitors, but also our allies, our friends and partners in the region, that we do have skin in the game, and we will be there to keep our commitments to them. If we if we make believers of all the parties to, to this uh, competition in that sense, then uh, then we have some chance to succeed. Uh, just to close, uh, we probably need to move on to we need to move on to another question, but uh, just uh, just one quick uh, uh, passage from Strategic Theory. Edward Lutwak points out that the, the, the Royal Navy during its imperial heyday excelled at using a single ship. A, he calls it a symbolic ship in order to have political effect on local audiences. But he also points out that in, for, in order for that to work, the, the target audiences for, for that demonstration had to, had to know beyond a doubt that the combined weight of the, of the Royal Navy's battle fleet stood behind that and would show up on the scene uh, if these audiences uh, they basically defied London's will. So whether that's a, whether that's a, whether that actually uh, comes into play with unmanned systems, I think uh, Hunter's made a pretty he's, he's listed several examples suggesting that that uh, that dynamic that sort of virtual uh, dynamic would not play out very well. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Defiba, uh did you want to ask your question about uh, the current administration? Um, all right. So if uh, if he's unable to, uh, the question was: Does the current administration have the will to conduct this pushback campaign? Um, and without national will, we're watching. Over. Well, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a, that's sort of the, the uh, sixty-four thousand dollar question, or whatever your favorite amount is. So I just, I think in the early going, the early going, it looks pretty good, actually. I'd say, I think that, uh, I mean, everybody thought that with the changeover of the White House, with the radical differences between the administrations, that you were going to see by necess by necessity a radical change in U.S. foreign policy and how we put that into practice. And I think the administration has gone out of its way to to show that that is not the case. I, yes, I think we'll see adjustments and so forth, but uh, but I think I, I think there's, at least there's a pretty good chance that. Uh, that you're not going to see that sort of radical uh, swerve in U.S. foreign policy. And I, I actually find that rather comforting. If you, if you go back through uh, U.S. diplomatic and military history, you don't you don't actually see all that many radical uh, changes in, in the direction of U.S. foreign policy, whether it's containment, whether it's uh, the Ramland strategy that I mentioned, whether it's the Monroe Doctrine, which was in, was in place uh, for at least a century, arguably to an extent even today. You see a lot of these concepts that have uh, – uh, that have staying power and they speak and they appeal across the political spectrum. So I at least hope, I, at least I hope that uh, that is the case in this one as well. I would, I would concur. Um, I think the international security strategic guidance that came, um, came out, um, last week was definitely, um, welcome. Uh, I will admit in terms of at the political level, I did notice that the, um, and it was excellent to see that they were prioritizing defending access to the global commons as, you know, it's essentially, you know, critical, like pretty much, you know, pretty close after the defense of the homeland, um, which is where it should be. I think the, the authors of the maritime strategy, uh, the tri-service maritime strategy really have it right that it's defend the homeland, freedom of the sea, and then defend our allies. Because frankly, you need freedom of the sea in order to get to the allies to help them out. Um, and accordingly, I think the, if I recall correctly, the interim national security strategic guidance ha takes a similar view. The only point I would make is that they would, they seem to adopt the old Obama era nomenclature, which is referring to freedom of navigation and overflight. Frankly, it's bigger than that. It's about the freedom of the sea. And, um, that is a larger concept than freedom of navigation. Freedom of navigation is a subset. Freedom of overflight is a subset, but Frankly, it is a much broader conversation. It is the um, it, it is about a legal and philosophical principle for which the United States has gone to war no less than six times. And the freedom of the sea, three different points in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson makes re, makes reference to different points about the freedom of the sea. So, I think my own view. I mean, he doesn't use freedom of the sea, but he talks about you know how the British have you know cut off our trade with all parts of the world, but they have uh, impressed our sailors and they, you know, forced them to take up arms against their countrymen on the high seas. And he has, you know, he has, uh, ravaged our seas, you know, plundered, or plundered our coast, our, our seas, ravaged our coasts and destroyed the lives of our people. You know, three different points in the, like, our founding document. This is something we really care about and rightly so. So I think that, 
freedom of the sea all the way. Yeah, we, we should stop talking about freedom of navigation. That's a small subset of freedom of the sea. And in fact, that hands that hands a, car, a trump card to uh, to our opponents. I, back when that, back when the PLA Navy used to show up in Newport from time to time, which unfortunately they don't anymore because things have gone south. But uh, they, they would have, oftentimes the lawyers among them would say, "We don't oppose freedom of navigation. They don't oppose movement from uh, from point A to point B." For commercial shipping, or even for military shipping, perhaps as long as you don't do anything military that's uh, that's that's codified in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, all the things they've been uh, uh, complaining about for many years, all the way back to the EP3 incident in 2001, or, or even before that. So if, if we if we play this if we play this on their rhetorical grounds and talk about freedom of navigation, we're almost we're almost conceding the point that we we should not be able to familiarize ourselves with the battleground or with the, with, the, with the potential battlegrounds by doing. Uh, sur- uh, surveillance flights and all that kind of stuff that we do do. So I, I really would like to see us uh, get our get our uh, linguistics straight, but uh, if we haven't get quite got there yet. <laughs> Absolutely, and I would just also add one other point. There is a popular notion in or in some parts of Washington, uh, particularly around uh, I'd say self self described realists, where they say, "Oh, the." Um, the United States has no interest in, free, in civilian freedom of navigation. We only care about military freedom of navigation. This is a point that uh, Tom Christensen made at um, the current strategy forum in Newport um, a few years ago. That are people are there are certain people who like to talk about civilian freedom of navigation, and we don't actually care about it. It's only military freedom of navigation that actually matters. And I really strongly disagree with that because. If you want military freedom of navigation, you have to defend civilian freedom of navigation. And one of the key responses from a lot of these, uh, that are allies and partners in the region is they, and they watch our freedom of navigation operations. So like, cool for you that you get the U.S. Navy, the, mo- the mightiest seagoing force there is, gets to sail wherever it wants, but we don't get to sail wherever we want. Our civilians don't get to go where they want. We, our civilians don't even get to use their own internationally recognized exclusive economic zone. How does this freedom of navigation operation help us? So that is really what the maritime counterinsurgency strategy is trying to implement, is to, again, to come back to Colonel Corbett, right, Colonel Art Corbett's words, is about protecting and empowering our allies. That it's not about us. It's not about us versus China. It's not about our own military freedom of navigation rights. This is about standing on principle. And when we it, you know, we stand on principle. We will be much stronger for it. Yeah, it's not enough to come and go. You got to go and stay. Well, gentlemen, it's uh, just past three thirty, and I I have to admit, I think that's a phenomenal foot stomp to end on. Um, I think it really speaks to um, the looking at this problem differently, which is the the theme of this series. And so, I, I think that's a great place to to end. I think it's been an excellent talk. I have always, as always, have learned. Uh, a tremendous amount from both of you. Uh, appreciate it as always, and looking forward to uh, future discussion and future projects uh, that involve these ideas. So, Ian, did you have any last words? Uh, not, not, uh, nothing except to say again, thank you to uh, Dr. Holmes and Mr. Styers for uh, for joining us for the conversation today, and as well, thank you to Dr. Wilhelm once again, uh, playing a huge role in helping us put these things together and continue this series on regaining the strategic initiative in the South China Sea. So, and I'll mention to our audience, uh, thank you for sticking with us for this this whole time. And I'll also note that I know from uh, Dr. Wilhelm and her community, uh, we're not done with this series yet. We'll have some future iterations going on down the road to keep the discussion going. So uh, again, thank you to the audience. Thank you to our guests today and Dr. Wilhelm for helping us put this together. For next week's broadcast, we will be back in our Thursday afternoon time slot where we'll be welcoming some new partners from the Modern War Institute of West Point's Project 6633 to discuss Arctic and Antarctic security issues. So I got to thank you all, and we hope to see you all then next week. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.